Uh, ben, the, uh, we sh I want to give him a coat of many colors. He's the favored son of Restoration Life, Ben DeSmukes. And uh, anyway, just a precious dear friend of ours. Him and Heather and his family are precious dear friends of ours. Love him with all my heart. And I, I really do believe the Lord's given him a word for us today. And so, Ben, just take your time. Love you, buddy. Um, and if you got snacks, you might need them. No, I'm just kidding. Now, we were talking yesterday, and we were saying, yeah, last time Ben preached, he preached for two and a half hours. And we were like, yeah, but that's the fastest two and a half hours this ever. And I agree. It was, it was definitely the fastest two and a half hours I think I've ever heard a uh, two and a half hour sermon. But it was so powerful and awesome. And so, Ben, we're so looking forward to what you have to share. Love you, man. And uh, look forward to it. All right, perfect. Let's pray. Can we do that? Lord, I just thank you so much for just giving me the opportunity to be here. It's, it's my pleasure to be with those that you've knit us together with um, in a relationship that is formed on Jesus Christ. I thank you for the Kesslers. Thank you for what you're doing in that family and for what you're doing by extension in this church, Lord. I'm excited to be here, Lord, and, um, and I know the weight of what you would do, Lord, is too great for me to be able to stand up here and think that I could do it on my own. Lord, I believe you've brought me here to give testimony to you and to proclaim you in a very specific way, and Lord, I can't proclaim it in the natural man, Lord, and we can't hear what you have to say to us in our natural minds. We need for you, Holy Spirit, to get us out of your way. And I ask, Lord, that you would do that. I ask that you would restrain me by your spirit. And I pray, Lord, that what comes forth would be born of the spirit, right out of the heart of God. And I pray, Lord, that you would pierce our hearts with the word, with the proclamation of the Son of God, I ask, Lord, that you would give us eyes to see Jesus in a way we've never seen you before, Lord. That we would be able to behold, even as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord and thus be transformed from glory to glory. That's what we need, Lord, is to be able to see you with clarity. Lord, that requires a work of your spirit. I cannot manufacture that. We have need for you, Lord, to open our ears. Lord, my conviction is that we have become the people of Isaiah 43, 8. That though we have eyes, we do not see. And though we have ears, we do not hear. And we need a touch of your spirit, Lord, to give us clarity. I ask that you would silence the voice of the accuser. I ask that you would silence the one who would distract us. There's too much confusion in our day, Lord. Too much confusion in our own souls. We have need to be quieted even in our own souls. I ask that you would do that this morning. And I pray, Lord, that there would be a clarity to your word. Lord, I'm convinced we cannot come into your presence and leave the same people. We would invite you, Lord, here in such a way as to draw us spirit to spirit, face to face with the Lord Jesus, to transform us. Lord, we give you permission, and I challenge you this morning to do this. Give the Lord permission to turn over whatever table needs to be turned over in our lives. That you might uncover, Lord, root issues that you mean to put to death in our own hearts. Idols that we're clinging to that cannot coexist with you. 
Lord, we give you permission to meddle in our souls, exposing the flesh that you might call us into a place of greater freedom, greater liberty, and a deeper devotion to you, a deeper intimacy with you. I'm convinced Brian is dead on, Lord. I believe in your kindness. You have extended an invitation to the present day church that is certainly not what we deserve. But it is an invitation to know you and to drink of the cup of intimacy in a way that is beyond our wildest imaginations. Lord, it does not come without cost. It will cost us everything. The great question that is before us is, am I worth it to you, church? Lord, we say to you this morning, we have tasted enough of you that you are worth it. We want you, no matter the cost. Come and do fully all that you desire to do in us this morning. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, somebody say, we're not off to a good start. You're on your pace to hit two and a half hours already. <laughs> so uh, my girls actually were appalled last time. They told me, they said, Dad, you can't ever do that again. <laughs> we were too hungry. So um, the good news is uh, for them that they brought snacks, the bad news for you is they brought snacks. So. <laughs> But I did get an edification from John not to go too long. I don't want to lose you, John, so I'm going to try to stay with me, okay? Um, I do get a sense from the Lord. There's a real ring up here. I don't know if you guys are hearing that or if that's just me. I don't know. If, anyway, um, I can be louder if I need to, and we can turn the volume down. I, I hate microphones because I hate the sound of my own voice. We used to record ours back home, and I would listen to it later, and it was excruciating to listen to my own. I don't know if you ever do that. Do you ever listen to your own teachings? Isn't it painful? I'm good. I think it, it, we just improved, so that, that's good. Um, I really do get a sense, you guys, that the Lord is present here this morning, and there's some very specific things that he wants to do. Um, I get a, can I just ask this question? How many of us have been battling discouragement in any way? particularly as it relates maybe to the season that we were in back in the fall and we were as a church, and I don't just mean this church, I mean the church. We were really contending for the purposes of the Lord in this nation, and we really believe that there was a specific outcome. And by the way, I just want to say this, God is neither Republican nor Democrat. God transcends politics. So I'm not going to come under this political spirit, but how many of us recognize there is definitely an agenda by the enemy to take this nation into the depths of a godless darkness? And we have been contending for the purposes of the Lord in this nation. And at times we've been contending for what we think are the purposes of the Lord for this nation. And some of us, I'm confident that because we didn't see what we thought that we wanted to see and what we thought the Lord wanted. And I'm convinced, I just want to say this very clearly, I'm convinced there was a very clear choice in the past election. I'm convinced that God's best for this nation is to give us not only a president, but congressmen, senators, uh, Supreme Court justices who love him and who want to see the Lord's purposes for this nation. That's God's best for this nation. But how many of you know that's nowhere close to being a reality in our day? God's second best for this nation, I believe, is a president congressmen and women, senators, Supreme Court justices, all the way in every position in our government is to give us men who will leave the church alone and not push a godless agenda on our nation. And I'm convinced we had a very clear choice in the last election and it didn't turn out the way that we intended for it to turn out, the way that we wanted it to turn out. I don't believe it turned out the way in, in the grand scheme of things was God's best for our nation and yet he allowed it. And for some of us, we've been in a place of we really battled and we really contended and we met together. And that's not a bad thing at all. That's a good thing that we contended that we were at least meeting and praying. But for some of us, we are really battling discouragement. If that's you, I just can you just 
lift up your hand? If you, I mean, is that, did that not touch anybody else? Because I know that it threw me into a little bit of, of a funk for a period of time. And for some of us, we were, we've just, we're weary because we battled so hard and for so long and we've been contending for the purposes of the Lord in our nation and we're not seeing it that there's just a weariness. I actually, I now know what the weariness is all about. The Lord showed me during worship. I was battling just fatigue yesterday and I couldn't put my finger on it and I kept thinking, is this allergies? Because this time of year, I always, allergies kind of get me and I'm always just a, a little more tired than I normally am. And it's interesting that as soon as I got up here, it just lifted. And I believe the Lord showed me in worship that I'm allowing you to feel a little bit in the natural what's on my people in this hour. And I'm convinced that the Lord's here to break off a spirit of weariness and a spirit of heaviness off of us as a people. I believe he also wants to give us some encouragement this morning. But I also believe this. I believe that as a people, and I'm not just talking about restoration life, I believe as a people we are stuck. And the Lord wants to unstick us in this moment. In fact, I believe the Lord spoke that to me as we came. And, and I'm super excited because we've never had warfare the way that we've had it. Um, I used to have it all the time when I preached. Uh, by the way, I'm not pastoring a church down in Edison anymore. I've retired. And so... Um, Nobody's laughing except for Ken. He's like, yeah, right, you're not retired. Um, I don't think you ever retire from this, do you? Um, we actually, my family and I have moved to Tennessee. We're in Cumberland Furnace, and uh, we're just enjoying retired life and not having to do this uh, week in and week out every Sunday. By the way, that's why I'm here. Brian needed a holiday, and so he reached out to me. And um, But we had just tremendous warfare. So we used to have warfare every every Saturday night, like we joked about it this morning, that Brian probably actually slept a little better than he normally does. No, he didn't. I didn't sleep much at all last night, but I was expecting it just because every time I preach, there's always resistance ahead of time. But we had tremendous resistance even the week before. Our dog, actually, when my girls were out riding their bikes, got into a fight with another dog. And literally, this is gross, but I'm going to tell you anyway, our dog actually had a good portion of her ear bitten off by another dog. And so it was really traumatic to our girls, and it kind of threw us into a little bit of a funk. Would you say that, Heather, that for a couple of days we were like, what in the world is going on? This is just weird. And we had a dog that we were trying to nurse. And if you've ever had an animal whose ear has been bitten, it's almost impossible to get the bleeding to stop. And our dog is an indoor dog, and I'll spare you the gory details, but it was just a really challenging time. And then we finally stopped at some point, uh, like a, a day or two later, and we realized this must be spiritual warfare. There's resistance to us coming to Marietta, and I believe the resistance is directly related to what the Lord wants to do here this morning. So I just, I want to challenge you. I, the Lord is here and I believe he wants to do something very specific. And what I've learned is that one of the greatest obstacles to the Lord being able to get at what he wants to get in me is my lack of honesty. My lack of willingness to be honest with myself and with the Lord. I mean, if you know that if you have some issues going on and we all have issues because we all have flesh and the Lord is here to touch those issues and set us free and call her into a deeper level of intimacy than if I'm not honest with myself, I'll miss out on an opportunity. And so I believe the Lord wants to encourage us as a body, but I also believe the Lord wants to call us into a deeper understanding of intimacy and a deeper relationship, a deeper uh, um, a communing with the Lord as Brian talked about where it's a lifestyle for us, not something that we do, that we experience deep intimacy and rich devotion with the Lord 24-7. How many of you want that? Amen. So I want to talk about the election. Obviously, I've already brought it out, and it's very, um, I believe it's very strategic by the Lord because I believe there are some things that if we have eyes to see, the Lord is speaking to the church at large that the Lord exposed through this season that we've come through. 
So if you're dealing with discouragement, if you're dealing with weariness, if you're dealing with disillusionment, if you've kind of even come into this place where you're like, I don't even know what to pray anymore. I don't even feel like I want to pray anymore. I've lost the motivation to pray because I fought so hard and so long for a specific outcome and it didn't happen and I'm just disillusioned or maybe confused. And I see a lot of heads nodding. First of all, you're not alone. But secondly, that in and of itself is a sign that we were fighting a spiritual battle and we lost the battle. I don't say that as condemnation. I say that as just a reality. I'm right there with you because I battled that throughout the month of January on into February. Because I believe the Lord wanted to do something and it didn't happen. And yet somehow I missed that we were fighting a spiritual battle. And I happen to believe it was a spiritual battle against a very high level spirit of witchcraft that ended up bringing confusion and discouragement to the church. That's a hallmark trait of a spirit of witchcraft, is it not? And so when you lose a battle... Rather than beat yourself up over it and feel condemned over the fact that you lost the battle and get into this spirit of condemnation, which some of us maybe are even wrestling with that, we need to be big boys and big girls. The way my mama used to say it, put on your big boy britches. Put on your big girl britches. You know that's actually scriptural. In Job chapter 38, the Lord says to Job, gird up your loins and I'll speak to you as a man. In other words, put on your big boy britches, Job. I have something to say to you. Guess what? Anytime the Lord says, gird up your loins or put on your big boy britches, it's probably not going to be a very pleasant word, but a very necessary word. And I believe the Lord wants to tell us this morning, put on your big boy britches, your big girl britches. You lost a battle. Don't get in a funk. Don't get discouraged. Learn from it. Remember the battle of Ai? Remember the Israelites went into Jericho and they, they went into the land of Canaan and they marched around Jericho and the Lord brought the walls down. And it was a tremendous victory against tremendous odds. The Lord brought a spectacular victory. And they got so overconfident that they decided they didn't need to regard the command of the Lord and they marched right into Ai and they lost. And Ai wasn't nearly the challenge strategically, militarily that Jericho was. And they got soundly defeated. Why? Because of sin in the camp. And so immediately they humbled themselves before the Lord and they sought the Lord and they were able to pinpoint the very one responsible. Remember that? So when you lose a battle, there's this concept that when we lose a battle, we need to humble ourselves and get before the Lord and learn from it lest we make the same mistake again. So we need to learn what the Lord would teach us through this. We lost a battle. Let's learn from it. So I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, give me a parallel. And by the way, the Lord's speaking all this to me in the past couple of weeks. And I said, Lord, is this battle on the level of AI? And I believe the Lord said it's much more complicated than AI. Would to God it was as simple as, well, we had some sin that we just need to deal with. And I'm not saying that America doesn't have sin it needs to deal with. I'm confident it does. And I'm confident that the church has sin that it needs to deal with. But it's much more complicated than that. And the parallel that the Lord gave me in Scripture is the battle of Aphek. So if you've got your Bibles, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 4. You say, this is not very encouraging so far. You keep saying we lost the battle. Get to the encouragement part. I'm getting to the encouragement part, I promise. So 1 Samuel chapter 4. The word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel, verse 1 by the way. Israel went out to battle against the Philistines and encamped beside Ebenezer. And the Philistines encamped at Aphek. Then the Philistines put themselves in battle array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was defeated by the Philistines, who killed about 4,000 men of the army in the field. And when the people had come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Great question, by the way. Anytime we get defeated... 
We need to stop and ask the Lord, what is it that you're doing? What is it that you're speaking to us? The problem is, is they didn't even hesitate to listen to the Lord. Immediately they said, let us bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord from Shiloh to us. Now I want you to take note of this. Let us bring the Ark of the Covenant out from under Shiloh, away from Shiloh into the camp. That's significant. We'll come back to that. So that when it comes to us, it may save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring from there the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts, who dwells between the cherubim. <clears throat> and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted so loudly that the earth shook. Now when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What does the sound of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? Then they understood that the ark of the Lord had come into the camp. So the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. And they said, Woe to us, for such a thing has never happened before. Woe to us, who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness... Be strong and conduct yourselves like men, you Philistines, that you do not become servants of the Hebrews as they have been to you. Conduct yourselves like men and fight. And so the Philistines fought and all Israel was defeated and every man fled to his tent and there was a very great slaughter. And there fell of Israel 30,000 foot soldiers. Also the ark of God was captured, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, died. Then a man of Benjamin ran from the battle line the same day and came to Shiloh with his clothes torn and dirt on his head. And now when he came, there was Eli sitting on a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out, and when Eli heard the noise of the outcry, he said, What does the sound of this tumult mean? And the man came hastily and told Eli. Eli was 98 years old, and his eyes were so dim that he could not see. Then the man said to Eli, I am he who came from the battle, and I fled today from the battle line. And he said, What happened, my son? So the messenger answered and said, Israel has fled before the Philistines and there has been a great slaughter among the people. Also your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead and the ark of God has been captured. Talk about bad news. Then it happened when he made mention of the ark of God that Eli fell off the seat backward by the side of the gate and his neck was broken and he died for the man was old and heavy. And he had judged Israel 40 years. You say, what has this got to do with the election? Well, it's really interesting, isn't it? Here Israel has been defeated in battle. And rather than do the wise thing and get before the Lord and humble themselves, Diane, and seek the face of the Lord, they presume to know the answer to their own issues. And they brought the ark of God... Hear this, the Ark of God. What does the Ark of the Covenant symbolize? It symbolizes the house of God. What is the house of God? The house of God is first and foremost Christ. He is Bethel. He is the house of God. And it is an impossibility for the house of God, i.e. Christ, to be separated from the Shiloh of God who is also Christ. It is an impossible thing that Israel was trying to do, to divorce the house of God from Shiloh. Who else is mentioned as the house of God? You and me, right? As we are in Christ, we too become a temple of the Holy Spirit. And so what we're seeing here is in symb symbolically the house of God being separated from Christ, the house of God wandering away from Christ. Are you beginning to see? Lord, give us eyes to see. Give us ears to hear what you're getting at. How many of you would recognize in our day, largely, we have a house of God, i.e. the church that has wandered away from the foundation, Jesus Christ. By the way, he's not just the foundation. He's the whole enchilada. And we've wandered away from Christ. 
thinking that somehow the things of God are more important than the God of all things. Somehow that if we can just latch on to the things of God, then we can change our circumstances. Have we not learned by now that even though, and I'm convinced of this, that God's best for this nation is to give us a godly government? I'm convinced of that. God's second best, as I've already said, is to at least give us a government who won't be antagonistic towards the church. Right? But he didn't give us either one. Why? Why? Because he's primarily concerned not with our circumstances. He's more concerned with his own people and their hearts and their condition inwardly. I want to say this, and I want to point this out, and I want to be very clear. It, you know, when the Lord took me to this passage, you, tremendous loss. Already 4,000 had died in battle. Real men who were really wounded with real swords and bled real blood. And some of those men, 4,000 of them, were not able to go back home to their wives and to their children. That's a very big deal to the Lord. I just want to say that. Like, no life falls, and it's not that big of a deal. Like, we read it, and we're like, 4,000 men died. Big deal. We didn't know those people. Didn't, didn't mean anything to us. They're just numbers to us. But when the Lord looks at it, the real people that he cares about very deeply, real children who are going to grow up without fathers, wives who've just been made widows, right? It's a big deal to the Lord. And it should have stopped there, but because of the arrogance of the leaders of the people of Israel, it escalated into something much, much worse. All of a sudden we go from 4,000 to 30,000. And I just want to say that the heart of the Lord, even though their leaders thrust them into a battle that wasn't even the Lord's, hear what I'm saying? The Lord's heart was for those men and for those families that paid a very real and dear sacrifice. And here's the sense that I got, and this is for you guys. I just want to say this, and I believe it's for everybody that contended and believed that the Lord's primary concern was to give us President Trump in the next four years. And you battled your rear ends off. I just want to say to you, the Lord, I get this sense, the Lord appreciates your dedication and your willingness to stand and fight day in and day out. I just want to say that. I, be encouraged by that. It didn't turn out the way that we were thinking it was going to turn out. That's okay. The Lord had a different agenda. But I just want to say this. Obedience to stand and fight when the Lord is speaking is more important than the outcome. Remember Jesus when he went into Nazareth? Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of Man who couldn't even do miracles in his own hometown of Nazareth because of the unbelief of the people, do you think that even Jesus wasn't at least a little bit tempted to be able to say, you know, Father, I did exactly what you told me to do, and not a single one of them was healed. I promise you that the man actually had to face that kind of temptation. But Jesus learned obedience... Through suffering, right? That's what Hebrews tells us. And he learned to just be faithful to the Father. And it was enough for him, whether the outcome that he was expecting or anticipating, whether it happened or not, it didn't matter. He was obedient to the voice of the Father. And I just want to say this. Be encouraged, church. Anytime the Lord is leading you to pray in a particular direction, just be encouraged that you were obedient. That in and of itself is enough. So what if it didn't turn out the way we were expecting? The Lord has a different agenda. Just be faithful and obedient to the Lord, and that is enough. That's our reward, isn't it, Ken? You of all people should know this. You've pioneered for years and years, and the toughness of being able to pioneer in ministry when there aren't others that you could look at and go, this is the way it needs to be done. And how many times did you battle discouragement and heartache over the years? Maybe once. <laughs> Do we need to confess the sin of lying? <laughs> so be encouraged. I'm, I'm telling you, the Lord is delighted. I'm, I honestly believe this. The Lord is delighted in your sacrifice, in your willingness to get into the trenches and gut it out daily and contend for the purposes of the Lord. For this nation, for this church, for this community, on whatever level, the Lord is delighted in your sacrifice. I just want to say that. So, 
Well, there is a parallel here, and it's really interesting. But we know this in this story, right? When the Lord raises up Samuel, and by the way, Samuel is a prophetic voice. He's the first of the prophets. There's no such thing as a prophet before Samuel. Am I wrong in that? Can you think of that? I mean, I don't remember another prophet in Scripture. Samuel is the first of the prophets. And so the Lord is doing something new in his own house, and he's already made it very clear to Eli that he's going to bring judgment on his house. And he raises up Samuel and says, you tell, you tell Eli that the judgment that I told him is coming. It's coming, right? Eli represents the leadership of the church, not this church. I just want to say that very clearly. <laughs> not this church. I'm talking about the church. You guys, if we have wandered away from the Lord himself, it is at least in part on the leadership of the church that led us away from the Lord. Now, it's not entirely their fault. I want to tell you that the people have been demanding to get what they want out of church. Now, the leadership, by and large, has kowtowed to the will of the people, but it's on both of us. And I just want to say that the Lord has issues with the leadership in his own house. That shouldn't shock us, right? We were told a long time that judgment is coming and it begins in the house of the Lord. And you guys, I was convinced when COVID came out. Were any of you guys convinced that we were seeing the beginnings of shakings in the church? And I think it's only going to intensify. And I believe that what we saw in the nonsense that was coming out of the church throughout the election and beyond, I'm convinced that was another realm of shaking in the church. And I believe it's because the Lord has issues with his leadership. Why? Because they're not leading us to Christ by and large. They're leading us away from Christ. I believe in the midst of it, the Lord is raising up some like the Kesslers who will be a prophetic proclamation of the person of Jesus Christ. I just want to tell you guys, you are so blessed to have the leadership. Brian didn't pay me to say this, by the way. He didn't even know I was going to say this. But you guys are so blessed to have in Brian and Angie and Ken and Donna and the whole Kessler family a family that will point to Jesus in all things. That is such a rare thing in today's church. I was driving up here a couple of weeks ago, and uh, we had the opportunity to just hang out with Brian and Angie. I had to do a wedding, which, by the way, Brian told me he has not done a wedding yet, so please, somebody get married, somebody get engaged and ask Brian to do a wedding because he's missing out on the fun of the pressure of having to do a wedding. And make sure when you do it, Brian, that you don't screw up that bride's special day. No added pressure or anything, but... Yeah, that's right, that's right. Um, so I, we were coming up to do a wedding, and, and I had, um, for two days, has this ever happened to any of you guys where for two days a song gets stuck in your head and you just can't get that, whatever that song is, you can't get it out of your head. For me, it was, of all things, it was Elton John's Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Now, I'm not an Elton John fan. I, I'm just going to be honest. I mean, I could take or leave his music. It just doesn't appeal to me at all. Um, I certainly don't approve of his lifestyle. Um, but I've always kind of liked the song, but for some reason I just couldn't get it out of my mind. And I was actually singing the lyrics over and over and over and over. Now, I'm not saying that every time you get a song in your head, the Lord's trying to speak to you. But how many of you know that if after two days all you hear is one song, it might kind of clue you in that maybe the Lord is trying to say something to you. And so I stopped and I said, Lord, what are you speaking to me? And instantly I heard in my spirit, my people are hitched to a dead horse called the church and it's high time they come out from under her. Lord, I thought we were talking about goodbye yellow brick road. What has that got to do with this? I mean, honestly, I'm like, did I hear you right in this? And, um, and then the Lord said to me, he said, go and, go and research what the meaning behind the song. So I got on the Internet. I, you know, I, I ain't real bright, but I do have a Google machine, so I can figure some things out if I Google it. And so I searched up the, the story behind the song. It's really interesting because it's about a man who is with someone who um, had a desire to chase after fame and success. And then having tasted of that lifestyle, grew so disillusioned with it that they said, 
there's nothing here. There's nothing rewarding here. There's no fulfillment in this. I'm going to say goodbye to it. Kind of like the the movie, The Wizard of Oz, right? Remember they were chasing. Remember that, Diane? They thought if they could just get to The Wizard of Oz, he would solve all their problems. And then lo and behold, they get there and they discover it's just a man behind a curtain. He can't really help us at all. Remember the disillusionment that Dorothy felt when she discovered that? Remember that? That's exactly what the Lord is getting at with us. We are chasing a fantasy in a fictitious realm called the church. And I'm not talking about the Lord's true church. Bear with me, John. I'm, I'm going to get to the point. Hang in there, brother. All right. I'm not talking about the true church because the Lord isn't against his true church. He's for his true church. I'm talking about the establishment. I'm talking about the institution that has wandered away from the Lord himself. And the Lord would expose that there is an element of falseness to the institution that will never bring satisfaction and fulfillment to you and me. It cannot. By design it cannot because only the person of the Lord Jesus can give what our hearts are truly longing for because they're longing for a relationship with him. And so unless the Lord begins to expose the faults, we are never going to get free and come out And so as soon as I read that, I thought, Lord, yes, hasten the day. But when the Lord said that to me and he said, my people are hitched to a dead horse and it's time for time for them to come out from under her. I instantly thought of two things. Number one, I thought of the harlot mentioned in Revelation. Is it 17? Revelation chapter 17. And I thought here we've become the harlot, not the people of God. I'm talking about the institution and those who are chasing after all that the institution has to offer. We've become the faults. And it's time for us to get out from her. Where else have you heard that language? Get out of Babylon, right? Babylon has come right into the church. The Lord would set us free. But when the Lord spoke that, I knew instantly how much of that system, how much of that institution and the ways of the institution had I almost reached into my very soul and there were tentacles attached down in the very depths of my soul. I said, what are you talking about? Let me give you an example. A couple of weeks ago, I had Easter for the first time. Now, some of you guys maybe did this last year. We didn't. I was pastoring a church. We lived in a very small community. And even though, hopefully no one from the governor's mansion is watching the live stream this morning, even though the governor had a strict no meeting policy, we still met anyway. We defied. We were civilly disobedient. We were exercising our constitutional rights. We, were, we just meant we were going to have church. Interestingly enough, it was a really terrible service, and there was really no anointing, and the presence of the Lord was not there in any way. And later on, the Lord said, well, you never asked me if I said you should meet anyway, so lesson learned. But we met anyway. But this year, on Easter, for the first time in my life, I spent Easter outside of church. Our, our um, church up in Tennessee, um, Terry Bennett's church, we only meet once every other week. And so it just, the way it fell, we had Easter as a vacation. And my wife loved it. And I struggled with it because I thought, I'm doing something wrong. Like, this goes against my upbringing. I feel guilty. Like, I feel like, I, I hate to say this, but this was my reaction. I feel like the heathens. Like, I need, to, I need to be in church. And the Lord told me, he said, you have no idea how deeply ensconced into your thinking the establishment, the religious establishment of the church is in you. And he told me, he said, you want to get free of this or not? You know, the sad thing is Brian and I were talking about this. We don't we do this in the church. We gather together for one day to celebrate the historical event of the resurrection of Jesus. And here we have something better than the historical event. We have resurrected life in us and we're not seizing the moment and we're not letting that resurrection life come forth in reality. We should be celebrating Easter 365 days a year. We should be chasing after that resurrected life in the person of Jesus Christ constantly. And yet we don't do it. We're satisfied with one day out of the year to just talk about Jesus and how he's no longer in a tomb. God, help us. So there are four things that I want to share with you guys that the Lord showed me. He said, these are four issues I have with the church. 
And I promise you, if we're honest with ourselves, at some point we're going to find that at least one of these things is a real issue for us and the Lord would put his finger on it. Let him. If it makes you uncomfortable, that's okay. Endure the uncomfortableness of the Lord hitting a sore spot in you so that you can get free of it. Right? Let's have some honesty. Not with me, because I'm not going to ask, with yourself and before the Lord. So the first issue the Lord told me, he said, the church is top-heavy and all the focus is on leadership. We do this, right? We have an old covenant understanding. Remember the old covenant? Remember Moses back in the wilderness where the people actually had a boundary and they were not allowed to go any further than the boundary. They weren't allowed to go up to the mountain where the presence of the Lord was. And the Lord told Moses, he said, Moses, I want you to come up the mountain and I'll meet with you and then you can tell the people what I've said. That's still our paradigm in the church and the Lord has an issue with it. Because under the new covenant, it's not just... Now, now hear this. In the old covenant, it was the priesthood. Moses symbolized the priesthood. He could go and meet with the Lord. But who's the priesthood under the new covenant? We all are. We're the priesthood that the Lord is establishing. I'm not saying we don't have need for leaders. We do. I'm not saying that there won't be revelation given to leaders that won't be made available to everybody. I'm convinced that that will still be true. But guess what? By and large, you aren't meant to have a proxy in your relationship with the Lord. Brian is not your go-between for you and the Lord. You shouldn't be dependent on Brian to get a word for the Lord from you. You shouldn't be dependent on a prophet to come in and give you a prophetic word from the Lord. You can get your own prophetic word from the Lord in a place of intimacy with him. We do this in the modern church, don't we? We want to find a group, a, a group of people that have it going on as far as revelation goes. We want to find a gifted speaker who's charismatic and has great delivery. We want to find a worship team that has the best kind of worship, that anointed worship. Because we think that by osmosis we can come into a deeper place in the kingdom as long as we're plugged into a group of people where the leadership is just going after the Lord. And it's a mistake. We did the same thing in our nation where we presumed that if we could just have someone in the White House who at least is an antagonistic against the church, then maybe the church will be blessed. And I'm telling you, we missed that opportunity for four years. We had a president that was not going on the offensive against the church. And what did we do with that time? Did we grow any deeper as a whole, as a church? Did we come into any deeper maturity in relationship with the Lord in that four years? Or were we just thankful that the judgments of the Lord were at least postponed for a few years? Ouch, Ben, you're not supposed to get that direct with us. We need a little more directness in the church, don't we? We've been skirting around some very, I don't think that you, I, you guys are used to it. I know Brian well enough to know he's very direct. I'm not worried about you guys not hearing a direct message. It is my conviction, and you see this throughout the Old Testament, that the government of the people by and large is a reflection of the hearts of the people. And every now and then, as he did in the kingdom of Judah anyway, the Lord would break through and in his mercy give them a godly king. But it never stopped the overall current towards godlessness in the nation of Israel and in the kingdom of Judah. Did it? Did it ever stop it? The Lord's government doesn't work from the top down. The Lord would establish his government in the hearts of his people. Hear this. The Lord is after something much greater, much more important than the government of the United States of America. He's after the government of your very heart. And I want to tell you the truth. I'm convinced that the plan and the purposes of the Lord for this nation, I'm convinced that his purposes for nations are without repentance. That the Lord will have at some point the full manifestation of his very heart for this nation, his very purpose for establishing it in the first place. The question is, is it going to be in our lifetime or are we going to kick that can down the road for another people? But how is the Lord ever going to get what he wants in this nation? It begins in you and me. 
He establishes it in the hearts of his people. You say, well, I'm not a politician. I can't enforce that on a nationwide scale. You're not meant to. If God's people will come fully under the government of God, I'm convinced he will give us a government that reflects the hearts of his people. So that's the first thing. Second thing, the church has elevated, and I've already touched on this, the church has elevated giftedness and downplayed the role of Christ-centered relationship when it comes to authority and leadership. We have churches that are being led by gifted people who are not seasoned people. I just want to say that very directly. And I just want to tell you guys, and I'm saying this, I don't mean to sound critical. If I sound critical, so be it. My heart is not to be critical. It's just to point out the obvious. We had in the prophetic movement, we had leaders who were saying things prophetically and there was no element of truth in what they were proclaiming, claiming to have heard from the Lord. Why, why would we listen to them? Because we've esteemed giftedness in the church. One of the things the Lord's been showing me recently is we are listening to people by and large, and I'm talking about on a nationwide scale, that we don't know who they are and we know nothing of their lives. Whatever happened to the kind of godly leadership that Paul espoused when he told the Corinthians, imitate me as I imitate Christ. I want to say this, and I say this, I, I, I hesitate to even bring this up, and I don't say this to in any way malign the man in any stretch of the imagination because I love the man even though he's no longer with us but if the Ravi Zacharias scandal doesn't teach us anything we're not paying attention I love that man and I love listening to him and I still do but it just highlighted the point that we don't know these people we're elevating. We don't know these people who are writing books and who have TV shows and who we're getting live streams from on a weekly basis. And again, I'm not talking about the Kesslers. You guys are in relationships with them. You know them. You see them on a daily basis. You see the way they live their lives. That's what godly leadership is meant to be about. But we're eating at the hands of people that we have no idea if there is a genuine expression of the life of Christ in their lives. What are we doing? Are you saying stop reading books that are written by people you don't know? I'm saying the Lord needs to change our default because our default is, well, if so-and-so wrote it, it must be good. Let me just pick it up and read it. I say don't read it unless the Holy Spirit is leading you to a specific book because you don't know the people. And we need to get back to a Christ-centered, let the Lord yoke you together with other people who are going after the Lord as he's done with the Kesslers. And imitate them as they imitate the Lord Jesus. That doesn't mean just copy them in everything that they do. It means to the degree that they're going after the Lord, you go after the Lord along with them. That's what real leadership is meant to look like in the church. And by the way, real leadership isn't about putting people up on pedestals. Have we not learned that every time we put people on pedestals, they're just going to fall off? Real leadership is let me get underneath you and push. Real leadership is let me lead you to the person of Jesus Christ. If they're leading us to the things of God, run away from it. But if they're leading you to the person of Jesus, run headlong, not to them, to Jesus, the one they're pointing you to. Again, the priesthood, you are the priesthood. You need to learn to get up that mountain and meet with the Lord himself. And you've been yoked together with leaders who will teach you how to get up the mountain and meet with the Lord. What a blessing. So the third thing, by the way, I was awful at that. I'm just confessing. When we were going through this whole election thing, I found every prophetic word from every so-called prophet who was saying what I wanted them to say, and I just chose to believe it. I picked prophets who I still to this day don't know who they are. I mean, honestly, I don't really care who they are because they were wrong. But I just chose to believe that what they were saying was accurate because they had anointed themselves as being a prophet. What foolishness. Lord, get this out of me. Let us stop chasing after giftedness. The third thing, the church is primarily concerned with the soul of man, not the son of man. 
How many of you know we have a real problem if we're more concerned about the soul of man than we are the son of man? We don't exist for the soul of man. In fact, church ought to be the most dangerous place for the soul of man. As it is, we are in the business of coddling people's souls lest they grow offended and take their tithes and offerings some other direction. God, help us. We give people what they want. They want a certain kind of worship. Well, then, by golly, we'll give it to them so long as they stay. They want to feel good about themselves, and we'll just affirm them and tell them how much the Lord loves them. By the way, the Lord does love you, but if you need to be affirmed in that every single Sunday, how many of you can say you're stuck in a place of immaturity? It's time to put your big boy pants on. And move on to the deeper things and allow the Lord to father you, not just by affirming you all the time, but to bring needed discipline into your life so that you can go on to maturity. I read a post the other day by somebody, and I probably shouldn't bring it up. I don't think anybody from my family is listening. This was actually a family member, but it was a poem that essentially referred to Jesus as the one who loves us just the way we are, imperfections and all. And how many of you know there's an element of truth in that? He does. He loves you even in your sin. But there was nothing calling people out of their sin in that poem. It was just, he's my best friend and he knows when I'm not having a good day and he knows when I'm, you know, sinning and he loves me anyway. And I thought, we're missing the heart of it, but that's that's probably a good 60 to 70% of the messages coming out of the present day church. We're just wanting to affirm people. And I love that the Lord loves me in my sin, but he has no intention of leaving me in the condition that he found me. I said this to my my daughter. I'm not a very intimidating person. I actually grew the beard. Michael, I love the beard, by the way. I'm, you're, the, you're the standard I'm trying to attain to. I got a little bit, little bit more to go. But I actually grew the beard out because I figured maybe I'd be a little bit more intimidating looking if I had a beard. Um, I look like Richie Cunningham, so there's no way I could ever be intimidating <laughs> by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, but, I, but, I, but I tried really hard to intimidate my, the, my oldest daughter is not with us. She's uh, living in Arizona. She's learning how to be a pilot. Um, anyway, her first boyfriend, when he came to the house, I thought, I'm going to do this right, and I'm going to get that boy into the den, just he and I, and I'm going to put the fear of God in him. And I did, and I sat for five minutes, and, the, and the, the poor boy couldn't even look me in the eye. I'm not talking about just that day. But from then on, he never looked me in the eye. But I told him, I said, son, I've been your age, and I know exactly what's on your mind. And I said, I just so you know, it, not with my daughter. And I said, I, this is what I said to him. I said, you found her in a certain condition, you will return her to me in that same condition. And I said, do we have an understanding? And he looked down and he said, yes, sir. I say that because the Lord has no intention of returning us in the same condition he found us. In fact, to be graphically honest with you, the Lord has impregnated us with his very seed. We are his bride. Should we expect anything less? And his heart is to see that seed come into a place of full maturity. I love what Terry said. I heard him say this a couple of weeks ago. But for the Lord to get what he wants in us, he's going to have to do it. We can never help the Lord out in any way by making maturity happen in us or making the whole process of being conformed to the image of Christ. Like We can't do that. That's a work of the Spirit, only a work of the Spirit. But, he said, if the Lord doesn't get what he wants in me, it'll be squarely on my shoulders. See, We can't do what the Lord wants to do in us, but we can certainly prohibit him from doing what he wants to do in us. Such is the essence of the journey, isn't it? The Lord has initiated something in us. What has he initiated? He's initiated that you and I become conformed to the image of the Son. A little bit? No, fully. Well, that's impossible. Yeah, with you and me it is. But the Lord intends to do it. 
The reason he hasn't done it is because you and I have been in his way. Again, I'm being very direct. I've been walking with the Lord. I got saved when I was probably 11, 10, 11 years old. I'm 48. I know I may not look it, but I'm 48. Why in the world is there not more? I mean, like, if you look at the disciples, right? They didn't have nearly as long as I have, with the exception, possibly, of John. I should have Christ oozing out of every pore. Why have I not? Because I've been satisfied with soulish things and chasing after the things that the church has to offer, thinking that there's life in them. If I got really serious about chasing after the God of all things, the Lord wouldn't need 30 some odd years to do a work of maturity in me. He could do it instantly if I would be willing to go down that path. The fact that the Lord hasn't had that expression. And I'm talking about true life. I'm talking about his love, his joy, his peace, his patience, his goodness, his gentleness. I'm not talking about giftedness. I'm talking about fruit. That's what the Lord is after in you and me. It's not works. We wrongly believe that the Lord is interested in works. He's not interested in works. He's prepared works for us. I'm not saying he's not interested at all in works. His primary concern is fruitfulness. That the seed he planted in you, Christ, would come to a place of maturity and full expression. And he does not have that in me, and he does not have that in the current modern day church. Not in this country anyway. The reason he doesn't is because you and I stand in his way. I'm telling you, the Lord is getting at something here, and he'll come and he'll set us free. He's calling us out of the system and calling us into a deeper pursuit of him. The fourth thing, fourth thing. The church is still trying to build an external kingdom while the Lord is building an internal, unshakable one. We thought in this last election that if we just had the right circumstances, then the Lord would be pleased with this nation. Well, the Lord, quite honestly, is not pleased with his own house because he does not have that internal, unshakable kingdom. We have got to get our eyes off of all the expressions that we've come to associate with life when the life of the Lord is an internal thing. The anointed worship, the charismatic speaker, the wonderful circumstances in my own life, the blessings and the health and all those things. I'm telling you, you guys, you know it as well as I do. The church is never brought into a deeper place of maturity as long as there's peace and prosperity anyway. Why should it shock us that the Lord has marched us right into, and I'm convinced we're seeing this unfold, and we will see this in the coming years in ways that will make our hair turn gray if it's not already gray. We are seeing a manifestation of godlessness in our government faster than we ever imagined we would. Understand that it is an opportunity for the church the Lord didn't want to go down this route. I'm convinced of that, that in his kindness, he would rather us just go after him during peace and prosperity. But he knows our tendency. He knows my tendency. I actually was telling Brian the other day, I prayed this to the Lord. I said, Lord, when I'm fat and lazy, or when, I'm, when, I'm, uh, when times are peaceful and prosperous, I grow fat and lazy, and I won't go hard after you. And I told the Lord, I said, always keep me in some form. Keep me lame so I'm dependent upon you, that I have to lean on you. It is the kindness of the Lord. It was the kindness of the Lord. Wasn't it, Sue, to touch the hip of Jacob and cause him to walk with a limp? That's a picture for us. And so if the Lord has done that on a nationwide scale, don't be discouraged. Know that it's exactly what we need in this hour to wake us up that we can go hard after the Lord. Stop looking to government to solve problems. It's only going to create problems. Look to the Lord Jesus. So, understand again what the Lord is after. He's not after, and, and, and this is, I think, my, our greatest struggle is that there's such phoniness to the outward projections of what we call life in Christianity. Right? I think if I could kind of hit one common theme with all four of these is that the Lord is after integrity in his people. 
He's after something real, not a form of godliness where there's no power in it. And that power, first and foremost, is to produce in you and me something that is authentic, the life of Jesus Christ. Hello. Are you with me? That ought to excite us. The life of Jesus. So that when Brian walks around, wherever he goes, Jesus is just oozing out of him. His love, his peace, his joy, his patience. It doesn't matter if he's in the midst of traffic. It doesn't matter if all hell is bro- broken loose against him. It doesn't matter what's going on in his body. The grace of the Lord is being manifested in the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And other people are picking up on the fragrance of Jesus in Brian. And some people are going to be drawn to Brian in that because they're going to be drawn to Jesus. And some people are going to hate Brian because they hate Jesus. But that's what the Lord wants to do in all of us, not just Brian, but in each of us. In you, John, you still with me? Amen. Awesome. How am I doing on time, by the way? As if there was a watch there, as if people even wear watches anymore. We've wandered away, you guys, from the Shiloh of God. We have. And the Lord is trying to get our attention. The sad reality is if we won't let him get our attention at this point, there's much worse, much harsher forms of shaking that can come our way. And I think for most of the church, for most of the church, we're going to face severe shakings of the Lord because we're not listening. For you and me, and I'm not saying we can avoid the shakings, but for you and me, we can make a determination today to get out to the Lord in wholeheartedness. We can make a determination today that I'm going to chase after the Lord and allow him to get the system, the institution out of me and let him expose the areas where the love for the things of God and the love for the faults, the fault system and the faults institution are actually keeping you from going further and deeper into the Lord. Let him do it. Let him uncover it. I want to share this with you guys. Brian told me he really felt like I should share this, and I thought it was crazy, but now I'm, I'm, I agree with you 100%. I need to share this. A few years ago, and I don't remember if I shared this story with you guys the last time or not, but we were, um, I was very much in a different vein of teaching about eight or nine years ago. This, what is it, 2021? Nine years ago. Nine years ago. And um, I was very much into what I call the prosperity gospel message. Now, it wasn't, my, my focus wasn't money, but I think there's different iterations of the prosperity gospel. It was signs and wonders and miracles. And I just believe anytime we, you know, anything bad happened that we could pray and see the Lord heal miraculously. And I do believe in the miraculous power of the Lord or the power of the Lord as is present to manifest miracles. I believe in that 100%. But again, that's an outward thing, and I'm learning to value. I'd rather see his power manifested in me to produce Christ than to ease my suffering by giving me a miracle. I'm convinced of that, 100%. And there are times where the Lord will withhold his hand to work a miracle because he's doing a greater miracle internally, and that's to produce his fruit in me. So I wasn't there nine years ago. Very much in a different camp. I could name a ministry, and I'm not going to name the ministry, but if I named the ministry, you'd know exactly what camp I was in. Very much a, a sort of a prophetic ministry and an outward signs and wonders. And, and, um, and we had, in 2012, I lost my nephew. He's 15 years old. He was out driving on um, our property and um, my brother-in-law's property and he was doing something he knew he shouldn't have been doing. He was driving reckless, but what 15-year-old boy who's learned to drive and has turned loose on a family farm isn't a little bit reckless. In fact, I had the same accident that he had when I was 15 years old. Rolled my truck over wearing no seat belt with a loaded deer rifle in the front seat of the truck and I walked away from it with a scratch on my wrist. So it was the hand of the Lord that spared me from that. Then my nephew goes through the exact same accident, just about a quarter of a mile away from where I had my accident, and he did not walk away. And it threw my family into a funk. 
And actually, I told Brian the story. We actually, my family, along with my sister's family, because it was my sister's son, and my parents and all of my brothers and sisters who were there, we, we actually gathered together in the emergency room as he was pronounced dead. And we believed for a miracle. We believed that the Lord was going to raise him from the dead. And we contended. I mean, we contended and we gutted it out for hours praying over my nephew's dead body, believing that this could not be the Lord and the Lord was going to have his say and this was not the final word of the Lord, that Nathan was going to live. Little did we know that Nathan was living in greater measure than we have ever experienced in our lives and will ever experience on this side of eternity. We contended and we contended, and even beyond that, going into the days before the funeral, we still had hope that the Lord was going to do a miracle and raise Nathan from the dead. How many of you know we serve a God who raises the dead, and he is still very much capable of raising the dead in an outward way. But I'm convinced that every one of Jesus' miracles, and I'm not saying that he doesn't do them today. I've heard modern-day stories, so have you, of the dead being raised. Every one of Jesus' stories is hitting at an internal reality that he means to manifest in you and me. And Jesus raises the dead on a daily basis. And I have need for him to do it daily in me. <laughs> Take these dead places of my flesh and cause your new life to come into me. Anyway, long story short, we were thrust into a funk the likes of which, I promise you, this election funk can't even begin to touch. How many of you know what I'm talking about? Some of you have been there. And it called into question every one of my sacred doctrines about the Lord. Now, I could have fought that and resisted that, and I could have come up with excuses, and I could have said... No, 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 it was just because we didn't have enough faith or we just didn't try hard enough or it was all on us, but my doctrines, I'm going to leave my... Don't we do that in the church? Like, I'll take the blame, but let's just make sure my doctrines aren't touched. When the Lord doesn't care two bits about our doctrines, what he cares about is how much do we know the person. And the Lord began because I think at the end of the day, something rose up in us where in the midst of our confusion and in the midst of our disillusionment, we said, Lord, we don't understand this. We just know we want you. And so, Lord, whatever has to happen, I don't think we even formed the words, but I think our hearts were whatever needs to happen. We just want you. So just, you know, like the, the prayers of David, whatever you do, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. You got to stay with me. I'm confused. I don't know what's going on. All of my doctrines are in, in rubble and my circumstances are really, really just lousy circumstances. But whatever you do, don't take your Holy Spirit from us. And it was about that time that the Lord began to take us deeper into a place of understanding that to have any level of intimacy with him, we have to go to the cross. It's got to be a daily thing. And the first thing the Lord did was he brought, obviously, he brought death to our doctrines and our confusion. And he began to highlight the person of Jesus in a way that we'd never seen him before. That's where we began this path of just going hard after the Lord. I just want to tell you, I'm sharing that to you guys. I'm here today, hopefully giving somewhat of an encouraging message in a time of discouragement or maybe at least a time where we've come out of discouragement and hopefully the Lord is connecting the dots a little bit for us where we're beginning to see that in a time of great upheaval and in a time of great unanswered prayers in terms of outward circumstances, the Lord would reveal to your heart what he's after in you. And if you let him take you down that road, he will do it. He's more anxious to take you down that road than you are to go down that road. All he's waiting for is a yes and amen from you. So here's what I want us to do. I, want, I feel very strongly to pray over you guys. And I want to pray for two things. Number one, I want to pray over those who have been discouraged and are battling discouragement or battling disillusionment or battling confusion, who are feeling the effects of having lingered in this long, drawn-out battle, and you've witnessed the casualties, and maybe you feel like you're one of the casualties, because I want to pray encouragement over you. And I just want to give you a little heads up in this. 
discouragement is a sin before the Lord. We think in our soulishness that we are victims of our circumstances and we can't control how we feel. That is not the case, right? We can't control what feelings come, but we can control what we do with them. And for some of us, we need to repent over the sin of discouragement. And I believe the Lord would encourage us this morning. So, the other group of people that I want to pray for are those who are saying, I hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to us. By the way, I just want to point this out. The Lord made very clear to me. You say, what in the world would a dog getting their ear bit off, what would that have to do with spiritual warfare? When we finally stopped and said, Lord, I think this is spiritual warfare, what are you speaking to us? The Lord instantly said to me, ears to hear, my son, ears to hear. How many of you know that, by the way, it's interesting, I don't think I made this connection, the lyrics to the, to the song, Goodbye Yellow Brick Road. Goodbye Yellow Brick Road where the dogs of society, um, was it the dogs of society howl? You can't plant me in your penthouse. I'm going back to my plow. Back to the howling old owl in the woods, hunting the horning bat toad. I finally found where my future lies beyond the yellow brick road. Boy, if the church ever needed to hear that. We need to get beyond the faults and the phoniness of the system that's promising us life, but it's just a form of godliness with no power therein. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We need to get back to understanding where the real value lies, not in the glitz and the glamour, but in the hard work of daily taking up our cross and getting after the Lord. What a message. The dogs of society. You know where else dogs are mentioned in Scripture? Remember when Paul says in Philippians, he talks about the dogs who maimed the flesh. It was the false church of his day coming in and Judaizing the church, the Gentiles who had never come under the Jewish system. And Paul refers to them as dogs. Dogs, by the way, in our society are cute and cuddly and everybody wants one, unless you're a cat person. Dogs in the ancient culture were useless and disgusting animals. They were not valued at all. What is Paul saying about the faults? So anyway, connecting this back to my dog Ginger, who's now has one and a half ears, the Lord instantly highlighted that the dogs of the church don't have ears to hear. The Lord told me, he made, you, want a, you want a prayer point for the church, contend that the Lord would give them ears to hear what the Lord is speaking, what the Father is speaking from the throne. And he's, all, he's speaking all about Christ and getting out to him in wholeheartedness. So if that's you and you have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying, then I want to pray over you too. And you're saying, man, I, I recognize that the church has too much of a hold on me. The religious has too much of a hold on me. I want to get free of it. I don't want to get after the Lord. How many of you, by the way, have been watching The Chosen, the series The Chosen? Has anybody all been watching that? What a beautiful picture of seeing real people. And this is what the Lord really impressed on me. These were real people who had real flaws, who I did such an incredible work in. I brought real transformation in a short period of time so that they no longer looked the same. They were different people. Why in the world after 2,000 years are we still walking around with I'm the same, honestly, Ken, I'm confessing this to you. I'm by and large the same person I was when I was 15, 16, 17 years old. I mean, I've gotten some victory over some sins. I'm not saying that there hasn't been a measure of growth, but I see very little increase in the life of Christ in my own life. Very little. I'm just being honest. Maybe a little. But how is it that these men could get filled with the Holy Spirit and instantly they're different people. I mean, the Lord did something in them. Why in the world, after 2,000 years of Christianity, are we not seeing that and more, right? I mean, they're, 
their ending point ought to have been our, at least our starting point. But after 2,000 years, you would think our starting point as the church of Jesus Christ would be well beyond where it was in Pentecost. As it is, we are well behind where they were in Pentecost. And I'm not talking about signs and wonders. I'm talking about in the expression of the life of the one who lives in us. What is it going to take? I tell you what. You can't make it happen, but you can stop it from happening. So I would say we ought to get clued in that if I'm not seeing it in my own life, I'm to blame. So if that's you and you're saying, man, I want to get out to the Lord in wholeheartedness. Something's got to give in my life. I can't tell you what that something is. I'm not meant to tell you what that something is. The Holy Spirit will show you what that something is, but let him deal with it so that we can get out and go wholeheartedly after him. And he can finally have the expression of his bride, the life that he's impregnated her with, in a greater measure of maturity. Are you with me in that? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you to stand. So if you want to get prayer for encouragement, discouragement, I want you to stand. If you want to get prayer, if you want to just be prayed over to go after the Lord in wholeheartedness, I want to pray over you too. So just stand with me. Lord, you see who's standing in this moment. And I am confident, Lord, that you spoke to me. And I believe that you came to encourage your people. And Lord, we confess to you our own discouragement, Lord. And Lord, like any sort of a source of any kind of woundedness or deception, Lord, we confess to you that we have embraced our own discouragement. That rather than laying it down quickly at the foot of Jesus, at the foot of the cross... We've embraced it, and we've become comfortable with it, and we've allowed the enemy to lead us right into a funk, playing right into his hands. We confess that to you as sin in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we choose to renounce it now in Jesus' name. And I ask that you would come in with the power of your blood and that you would break discouragement off of our backs in Jesus' name. We relinquish it fully in Jesus' name. And I ask, Lord, that you would encourage us Lord, the opposite of discouragement is to be filled with your courage coming directly from your spirit. I ask for a release of the courage of the Lord in the hearts of your people. And Lord, where you want to bring understanding, a deeper level of understanding as to how we missed you and why we missed you, Lord, I ask that you would do that. And where you're restraining our understanding, let us be okay with that. And let us just embrace the fact that we were obedient to you to pray what we believe you were telling us to pray. And we'll trust the outcome to you. Forgive us, Lord, for looking to circumstances to dictate whether or not we were in the will of God or not. We refuse to go down that path in Jesus' name. I ask that you would break confusion off of the minds of your people, Lord, in Jesus' name. We have looked to the wrong things to provide clarity to us. We've been looking to wrong sources, and we confess that to you. It's sorcery, and we want nothing to do with it in Jesus' name. We ask that you would speak to us, that you would go right to our hearts, that you would bring clarity in places where you long to bring clarity. We choose to have our ears open by the Holy Spirit to you and you alone, Lord. And we ask that you would expose every other voice. I ask that you would give us the divine enablement to take every thought captive that it would not find a home in our minds any longer. In Jesus' name, I ask for a release of clarity on your people, specifically on this house, Lord, and I thank you for their willingness to fight and to stand. I thank you for their courage in the day of battle. I ask in the name of Jesus that you restore it and then some. I ask, Lord, for clarity that you would give a renewed sense of direction in the place of intercessory prayer in this house. I ask it in Jesus' name. I pray, Lord, that what you spoke of in Isaiah 43, Lord, that it that would be true in this house that, you, that we would remember not the former things, that the Lord God himself would arise in this house and make a way in the wilderness. I ask it in the name of Jesus. As it pertains to prayer, Lord, that you would take this house into a deeper place of effectiveness for your kingdom and for fighting for the establishment of your kingdom. I ask it in Jesus' name. 
Lord, I also want to pray for those of us, Lord, who say there, we've heard something of the Holy Spirit this morning where you have beckoned us into an abandonment, Lord, that we've been too afraid to go to before. Or maybe we didn't even know we needed to let go and, and chase hard after you. But, Lord, there's something within our hearts where we say, yes, I've got too much of the old in me. I've got too much of the, the system that's promoting a form of godliness where there's no life in it. And, Lord, I want to run away from that and go headlong into intimacy with you, Jesus. Lord, you see our hearts, and Lord, whatever it is that you put your finger on this morning, whatever issue, Lord, that you've unearthed, Lord, we just say to you, you are God, and we relinquish that to you fully. Would you turn over our tables? Would you pull down our sacred doctrines, Lord, that we haven't allowed you to meddle with in the past? And would, we, would you just open our eyes and give us a glimpse of Jesus? That's all that we're desiring in this moment, Lord. It's what we want. We want to move on to a place of maturity in you. I ask, Lord, that you would do a deep cleansing in us, in your people, Lord, that you would not only get us out of the Babylonian system, but that you would get Babylon out of us. Get the harlot out of us, Lord. In whatever way, get the religious out of us, Lord. I ask it in the name of Jesus, where we've been content with outward forms, with outward things. I pray, Lord, that you would expose our, our desire for outward things as being of the soul and not of the spirit. And we ask that you would take us by the spirit into a place spoken of in Corinthians, Lord, where we would be content beholding you, as Paul says, even as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord that we might be transformed from one degree of glory to the next. I ask that we would find our contentment, Lord, in just being with you, sitting before you in a deep place of communion. I am convinced that is the precious, precious invitation that you've given to us in this moment. I actually believe there's a window of grace for us, Lord, that if not seized upon, our hearts will become hardened. May it never be in this house, Lord, and may it never be in us individually. We might hear and heed the invitation of the Lord. That we might be like those men in Israel on the day of Pentecost who were ordinary men who had no desire for the religious system of the day. They had been with Jesus, and they had been ruined for anything else, Lord. Nothing else would satisfy them. And in an instant, you came into them, Lord, and set them free, at least in measure, to the faults. Would you do it in us, Lord? Would you open our eyes, Lord? I'm convinced that... Just as the account in the book of Mark, Lord, where you touched the blind man and he was able to see, except for he saw men like trees walking and he needed a second touch from you. Lord, I believe that's our journey. We need a second touch from you. In fact, Lord, my journey has pretty much upheld the truth that I need touches from you periodically. And Lord, I believe we're at another critical juncture where you would cause us to see the Lord Jesus himself in a way we've never seen him. In a way that calls us into a deeper place of surrender. That we might enter into a deeper place of maturity in you. Would you, in an inward way, Hear this. Take aim at the government of the soul. May it go the way of Hophni and Phinehas. And would you break our necks in our souls in the very way you broke Eli's neck, that our heads might turn rightly to the head, Christ, that your government might be formed in us, Lord. We ask for it, Lord, in Jesus' name. We are giving you permission, and we recognize this. We are giving you permission to take us whatever, through whatever circumstances you deem necessary in all this. Lord, we trust you in that. Only don't let us miss this opportunity to come into a deeper place of maturity in you. We commit ourselves to you, Jesus. We commit ourselves to you in this. I ask that what it, 
Each person is committing themselves to before the Lord Jesus in their spirits would be sealed by the Holy Spirit this morning. That you would honor the cries of our hearts where we say to you nothing but knowing you fully will ever satisfy us, Lord. We will never find satisfaction in the church again. Never find satisfaction in the outward things again. Never find satisfaction in the old system. Seal it, Lord. And lead us to the one who is not only the desire of the nations, but is the very desire of our souls. You are what our souls, our true souls, are. Tr you're what our, tr our true souls are truly desiring, Lord. Not the soul that's under the dominion of the flesh. The flesh wants to live. The flesh is keeping us from coming to know you. But you're the one that we truly desire. Would you make war on the flesh and bring it to its end internally in us? That we might have you and that you might become, that we might become to you the possession of the Lord. I ask it in Jesus' name.